If you guys have never been to Clear Lake City, just like me, we need to picture a picturesque, beautifully located town in the Bay Area of Greater Houston, Texas. So it was built from the ground up to become one of the largest planned communities of Houston. And this is big oil country, where the likes of ExxonMobil has come in, bought everything oil up, and now call it home. It can also boast the likes of NASA, Boeing, and Lockheed Martin. You can admit those are some heavy hitters, right? But there are some things that Clear Lake City would rather never talk about. And that's also being known for some high profile crimes. Like in 2001, when Andrea Yates drowned her five children in a bathtub because she wanted to save them from Satan. So effectively she did because she was Satan. And then in 2003, Clara Harris, a dentist, caught her orthodontist husband practicing on one of his patients except that it was in a hotel room as he was coming out she just put the pedal to the metal struck him with her car and it propelled him 25 feet and this wasn't enough she drove around medians over obstacles like bushes and stuff in order to run him over three more times and who could forget when in 2007 lisa nowak the lovesick astronaut drove 13 straight hours while wearing something I could only describe as a premeditated diaper because she didn't have time to make those bathroom stops because she was in a hurry to attempt a kidnapping of a Florida woman who had won the affections of the man she loved. She pepper sprayed and severely beat this woman. Now, it's merely unfortunate that these all happen to be women. And it's gonna be unfortunate once again for Clear Lake because the case that we're gonna discuss today will also involve a female, a girl so consumed with jealousy that it would negatively impact anyone that fell into her circle. She was the sweetest person you'd ever meet in the beginning, but eventually, being her friend was like navigating through a minefield of pettiness. You're about to meet a very damaged individual and the only things her victims ever did to her was to be her friend. My name is Monks and women scare me sometimes. So our story is gonna begin in 2003. We need to meet Rachel Colorodis and Tiffany Rowell, who were best friends attending Clear Lake High School. Now, in this fairly large school, they were the popular girls that wove seamlessly through the endless cliques, of course, that is high school. Now, Rachel is described as the beautiful girl next door, you know, who had the heart of gold and an overachiever to say the least. She utilized her time impressively for any age. Besides the rigors of school and homework, she babysat. She got jobs at places such as UPS, Denny's, etc. She also led the youth drama club, was a youth counselor, but all this was just a prelude for her actual goal of joining the Air Force. And as birds of a feather, Tiffany was no different from Rachel. Also beautiful and social, she was regarded as a talented actress, but her heart, get this, was set on becoming a social worker to help families cope with hardships. So it's needless to say that they were raised right and they had wonderful futures ahead. So in line with their personalities, their kindness went out to the new girl in school and her name is Christine Pale Leela. Now for Christine, her time at her old school was insufferable because she was constantly bullied. She suffered from alopecia, which caused hair loss in her scalp, her eyebrows, and even her eyelashes. For this, she would always wear a wig, and to add to her troubles, she had extremely poor vision, to which she had to wear thick glasses. It made her the daily target of cruelty as kids would snatch her wig off her head and mock her glasses. Simply any way to embarrass her. Now, if they only knew that she had lost her father at an early age, which sent her mother spiraling into alcoholism, would they still be that mean to her? What if they knew that her mother would lose custody of her because of her drinking, which left Christine in foster care, scared, scarred, and lonely? Now, if they knew all that, would they still be that mean? For some reason, I think yes. But while in the foster home, things eventually began to look up. When her mom finally got sober and met a man 
a good man named Tom Dick. She was able to regain custody of Christine, and they moved to a nice suburban neighborhood in Clear Lake City, Texas. And here we are. The characters and the background are set. Let's go ahead and describe this dream, which of course would disintegrate into a nightmare. So Rachel would meet the new awkward girl in communications class, and it was no surprise to her father that uh, she would go out of her way to befriend this new misfit because she was always a champion for the underdog. Now, Rachel would immediately take a liking to Christine, and she would go home that same day to tell her father that she met one of the sweetest girls in school today. So from that day forward, Rachel and Tiffany would take Christine under their wings and show her actual kindness and the three grew inseparable they would write in each other's notes to express their adoration of one another christine would bring her new bffs to her home they would meet her parents and they spent the remainder of the time in christine's room talking now her mother noticed something very peculiar christine had taken off her wig and went simply as is with her two new friends which would warm any parent's heart because it kind of meant her little girl had finally found real friends. And it would only get better for Christine, as the popularity of her friends would propel her into the same statusphere. And I claim the word statusphere if someone didn't already make it up. Her confidence went up and up. Her need to be accepted was met. Life was grand. And during this time, she really blossomed in all the ways imaginable, from sociability to even appearance. And to top it all off, that year, she was voted by her school as Miss Irresistible. And sadly, it was Rachel and Tiffany's senior year. So they would have to leave Christine, who was just a junior, behind. Now, after graduation, there were the customary well wishes and goodbyes. But the trio promised that they would always stay connected and be friends. At least that's what Christine thought. Once out in the real world, Rachel would move in with Tiffany and basically just began their next journey in life together. Now, this is where the fairy tale falls apart and rather quickly. You see, Rachel and Tiffany remained busybodies. They lent themselves to various work and charities like they've always had. Now, Tiffany even started dating a guy named Marcus Priscilla. All this left Christine feeling left out as she started hearing less and less from her besties. Then one day, a man with body piercings, spiked hair, chains showed up at Christine's door looking for her. Now, Christine's mom answered the door, and this is what she had to say, that this man's eyes made her uncomfortable. And why was he looking for Christine? Well, that's because he was her boyfriend, Christopher Snyder, locked up for armed robbery, but now was back. He was two years older than she was, which was already statutory at this point, and before he was put away, he had almost ruined Christine's life by introducing her to drugs and crime. Now he was back to what? Finish the job, I guess. Now, Christopher Snyder was known to Rachel and Tiffany as Christine was very candid with them about him. And they tried to talk her out of being with him, to disassociate with him, but they couldn't get through to her. Her parents grounded her and took away privileges, but it didn't stop her from going to him. They took out a restraining order and threatened to have him arrested again, but still they found a way to be together. Her stepfather, Tom, said that Chris had some mental control over her. Now, I'm sure you've realized by now, she's the crazy person I was talking about in the introduction and just know that as much control as she allowed Chris to have over her, she is much more fucked up in the head than he could ever be. The relationship was abusive, insanely toxic on both ends. One incident was at Chris's house when they had an all-out shouting match in front of his family about the possibility of Chris's infidelity. Not that there was even proof of one, okay? This forced him to physically remove Christine from his home, but she didn't leave. She slept on his lawn the entire night just so she could continue arguing with him when she woke up. And as much as Christine's family hates Chris, Chris's family hates 
Christine. According to Christine's sister, Brandy, Chris had to call the police on this quote-unquote psycho, her own words, numerous times because Christine was obsessed with him and was jealous if anyone even looked at him. It was a crippling type of jealousy that didn't only pertain to Chris, as you guys will find out. It was in regards to whomever didn't give her the attention she wanted. And unfortunately for Rachel and Tiffany, they weren't giving her the attention anymore. But they were also attractive and wouldn't it be a smart wager that she started feeling threatened by them because, I mean, look at him. He was Mr. Irresistible, wasn't he? And it was definitely petty because these girls probably would have never gone for a guy like that. And all these girls wanted was to start their lives. But on June 18th of 2003, their story abruptly came to an end. Thirty-seven oh six Millbridge Drive was set to be the location of a house party. Now, those in the house beforehand were Rachel, Tiffany, her boyfriend Marcus, and his cousin Adalbert Sanchez. A phone rings within the house at about three p.m. Marcus answers and tells the caller, a girl named Brittany, to call back later because Tiffany was in the restroom. Now, more than an hour later, Brittany calls back again. But the phone keeps ringing with no answer, no callback. She simply figured they were busy, maybe out gathering things for the party. At 6 p.m., she would pull up to the house with her boyfriend and she saw that the cars were there. Leaving her boyfriend in the car, she went to go check to see if anybody was home. No one answered. She tried peering into the window with no luck. She started banging on the door and then she realized that it was unlocked. She let herself in. She saw all four of her friends lying around taking a nap. Two on the couch, two on the floor. Then her mind started processing all the bullet shells that were littered everywhere. And then she saw all the blood across the walls, the ceiling, and she started screaming. Her boyfriend heard Brittany's cries and was out of the car to see her collapsing on the lawn hysterically. She was pounding on the grass. She didn't know what to make of anything. She told him what she saw and he too would enter the house to have the same horrifying scene etched into his mind as well. Houston Police Sergeant Brian Harris believed that there was a personal relationship between the victims and the killers. They were all shot at point blank range and they were all shot multiple times. Now, the spent shells indicated two different weapons, leading them to believe that there were two different killers. Now, the police were already canvassing the neighborhood for any potential clues. They would be able to find witnesses that saw a male and a female, both in dark clothing, walking up to the house at around 4 p.m. The female had on a bandana and abnormally large eyes. So sketch artists would get to work, and this image did make the rounds now to me and you. At this point, it could look a tad familiar, but to detectives then, it could have been just some random drawing and a year would go by and nothing. And then another year would go by and still zero suspects. And then another year. Until Rachel's father pretty much gave up hope that the police could even catch a code, let alone the murderer of their daughter. He would take matters into his own hands and started conducting his own investigation. But it wasn't until he started plastering that police composite all over large billboards across the town with his own money, by the way, it finally paid off. The billboards created a stir and news channels began to cover the story once again. A man saw the sketch and thought to himself, hmm, how similar that looked to a girl he had attended rehab with, a girl who had confided in him about a crime that was eerily similar to what the news was reporting. He called Crime Stoppers and gave the police the name of Christine Paolila. And not to diminish this man's good deed, but $100,000 is probably a good motivator as well. Now the police finally had a name and started following the breadcrumbs, or more fitting, 
The Trail of Discarded Heroin Needles. Christine Paolila was living in a hotel room in San Antonio with her now husband named Justin Rott. His name was the most fitting for how they were living, holed up in this filth waste, and there were hundreds of discarded syringes everywhere. Spoiled food, blood splatter, even dog shit was left lying around, just like two subhuman occupants that spent their days high as fuck. And it just so happens that one night, the news was on the TV and Christine sobered up quickly when an old story of four teenagers being murdered in Clear Lake was being covered again. The sketch of the female was plastered on the screen and Christine went into paranoia and repeated over and over to herself, oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my. She turned to her beloved Justin and demanded, does that look like me? He said it did. And Christine then proceeds to tell Justin, for whatever reason, maybe it was love, exactly what happened that day. So Christine didn't feel just left out that her best friends Rachel and Tiffany moved in together and now starting their lives together without her. She was also jealous, as we talked about earlier. So she told her low-life boyfriend at the time, Chris Snyder, that she knew of a place that they could rob and have a real come up. Those bitch ass friends of hers, ex friends of hers. Now I'm not too sure if Christine knew that Rachel and Tiffany were planning a party or not, but she definitely knew where Rachel and Tiffany would be. At around 4 p.m., Christine had on her bandana. She and Chris walked towards the house where they would be spotted by neighbors. And of course, the girls, knew who Christine was, and this must be that low-life Chris. Now, being cordial people, being nice people, they allowed them into the house, even if they didn't want to. Now, here things are about to get out of hand. They're gonna get a little graphic. Your discretion is advised, of course. Now, I'm gonna paint you the picture. Tiffany and Adelbert were on the couch watching TV. Marcus and Rachel were just standing around. And that's when the guns came out. Chris held Tiffany, Adelbert, and Rachel at gunpoint as Christine forced Marcus to lead her to the valuables. Once they had what they wanted, it's most likely the victims were just relieved that it was over because it was clear they never expected what was coming next. Adelbert and Tiffany were shot at point blank range while still on the couch with absolutely no defensive wounds as the bullets started flying. This caused Marcus to fall to the left of the couch and he was beaten with a gun and then shot. Rachel was shot near the TV and fell to the rug as blood pooled around her. The killers, seeing that everybody was dead, quickly exited the crime scene. But what they didn't realize was that Rachel was still alive. She started slowly crawling despite the agonizing pain towards the cell phone she had dropped when she was shot. It was sheer willpower that she was finally able to grab her phone and started dialing all the while choking on her own blood. But then something struck the back of her head and she would be beaten to death with the butt of a gun. Christine had come back. She had already left the house, but she just wanted to make sure that everyone was dead. Detectives would find Rachel in the worst state as her head was completely bashed in. They find the phone next to Rachel and it becomes one of the most chilling details of this crime because on the phone, there was a nine and a one. And here's some more detail. If you need convincing that this was a crime of sexual jealousy, only Rachel and Tiffany were shot directly on the crotch. So now let's go ahead and go back to San Antonio where they found Christine in that shithole. She was taken into custody, but the manhunt for Chris continued. But not for long. Because Chris, in contrast to all those piercings and tattoos and the bravado, he was just a pathetic coward. 
once the murders of Clear Lake started circulating the news again and his composite, he took his own life, overdosing on a bunch of pills. And of course, Christine would take this opportunity to throw him under the bus for everything. That she was abused and controlled by him, going as far as to say that she didn't have the courage to shoot. So Chris put his finger on hers and squeezed the trigger. But nobody was buying what her dumbass was selling because it was her own big mouth and stupidity that literally got her arrested and ultimately convicted of four counts of capital murder. Her junkie husband and a man from rehab had chilling details that she confessed to, especially the gruesome details of Rachel's execution. And here's a funny little twist I saved just for you guys. You know the man from rehab? Well, his name was Justin Rott. Yes, her new husband. So there is no loyalty amongst heroin addicts, as the old adage goes, I think. Her own husband turned her in. I mean, $100,000. That's a lot of brown sugar. So Christine Paolila, she was just 17 when she committed these crimes. She was tried as an adult and given 40 years to life. Now, I'll never understand why the justice system feels the need to add any other words, any other numbers after the word life to an obvious murder case. But what do I know? I just, what, what is it? It happened in 2003. It's now 2023. That's 20 years. 40 Another 20 years, I better delete this video when she gets out, just in case she comes looking for people. All right. Anyways, my name is Monks. Like if you subscribe. Like if you subscribe. Much love to my Patreons. Invertiblade, KBG, Uncool Dre, Tony Quinn, and Jan702. A special shout out to Maya Parker, who told me to do this case, and I'm very glad that she did. Sorry if I'm clanging the thing with my ring. Anyways. Now go protect the ones you love and love the ones that protect you.